thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Mindy Huckins. I'm the Senior Director of Family Services here at Gateways. Hopefully you're all here for our brand new family support portal training. Um, if, you, if that's what you're looking for, you're in the right place. Um, we also have with us from Gateways, um, Mike Hurley. He is one of the developers of our portal. So he's here to answer any questions you might have for the portal. Um, so let's get started. So first I wanna let people know that we are recording this session so that families who aren't able to make the training sessions can view it at their own time. And also if anyone needs a reminder or wants to watch it again, we have that available to them. This portal is brought to you by our Family Support Department as well as our Family Support Advisory Council. All of the area agencies are required to have a council for family support that acts as a leadership board. Our council is made up of family members and caregivers and individuals that we serve in our family support program. One of their jobs is to assess the needs of families and continue to guide gateways into development of services and tools that help our families to move forward. And this is one of the initiatives that they've been working on. So they have helped give us feedback on this portal. They've piloted the portal and we're really grateful to bring it forward. This isn't the first portal that Gateways Community Services has had. We've had a, we have another program that uses a portal for the last seven years, and they have been extremely successful. And we've had a ton of wonderful feedback from those families saying the portal is say it's a lifesaver. Um, so that's why we're bringing the portal to you today. It's really important to us that we can continue to offer you as families tools that make it easier for you to manage your family and also to get the services and supports that you need from us here at Gateways. The great thing about this portal is that it's available to you 24 seven. So we all know that most of you spend your time trying to wrangle your loved one into bed. And by the time you get a snack, you look at the clock and it's already 930 at night. So it's not always a convenient time to call into the agency because the agency is closed. This portal will allow you to have access to resources that you need, submit things, and also give you another way to reach your service coordinator should you want to. The best practices are recommended through the quality standards of family strengthening. All of our service coordinators are certified uh, through family strengthening and their guidance tells us that when we can offer families a variety of ways to get their needs met, that it's the best way to serve you as families and we are highly committed to that. So we hope this portal checks that off for you. In addition, we serve over a thousand families in our family support program just here at Gateways Community Services. So the other value of this is that you'll see that we'll be able to process payments, we'll be able to get them out faster to you and give you a more streamlined approach towards processing all of your claims. So that's a bit of the why and then the when. So starting July 1st, we will ask that all claims, all requests come in through the portal. And the reason being is that our nonprofit runs on fiscal calendars, which I know makes absolutely no sense. So we do not run on the calendar year. We run on fiscal years, which start on July 1. So your new funding starts on 7-1, July 1, 2021. And that's when we will transition and accept all of our requests through the portal. So I thank you for taking the time to get to understand the portal and ask questions so that you can still continue to access all the services that are important to you and your family. So for today's presentation, what I'm going to do is go into the portal, show you how to access it, how to log in, and then go over the features of the portal. What I can do is go through each section and at the end we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers so that way I can make sure I answer all of your questions before you part with us today. So without further ado, I will start sharing my screen and show you how to log into the portal. Okay. So our family support portal can be accessed through any web browser. So any old way that you go to get on the internet to, to go search websites or go into Google is a perfect fine way to log into the portal. You can just search Gateways Community Services and it will pop right up. We use our website to access the portal or you can type in our web address. So it's www.gatewayscs.org. When our website pops up, it looks like this. And right at the very top, it says My Gateways. If you put your mouse over it, it will change colors. And if you just click that, it'll bring you into the login. So before July 1, we will be using the email you have on file with your service coordinator to send you your user ID and your password. 
But do not worry if your password or your username, you can't find it in your email or it's 930 at night and you can't quite remember it. We've set up some very easy tools for you to get that reset and resent to you within a few seconds or minutes. Um, that way you're not held up by any processes. If you cannot remember your password or your user ID, you can go right here to look up your user ID. All you have to do is punch in your email address, as long as it's the same email address we have here at Gateways, and it will send you your username. So that way, if you're there at night, you don't have to wait a whole nother day for Gateways to be open for someone to send you your username and password. You can do it right here through our site. So I'm going to go ahead and log in using my practice login and my password. And this is our family support portal. You know, because at the top it says my family support. So we call our portal my family support, and this is what it looks like. So what I'm gonna do now is go through the layout of the portal and explain each of the features. And then I will show you step-by-step -step how to submit different items. So here on our left is what we call our information section. So this section is for you at your leisure. What we've done is identify different documents and forms and resource lists that are really often asked for by service, by families, by service coordinators. And we've put them here on the portal. So that way you don't have to dig through your email and find that email that your service coordinator sent it to you. You can just go right here to the portal and get access it. Some of it is, here's a fact sheet on our council in case you have interest in joining our family support advisory council. We also have our release of information. So one time, sometimes uh, you might ask us to reach out to your school district or someone on your team. And in order to do that, we need a release of information. So we have those documents right here for you right at your fingertips. The next portlet is for guidelines. And so all of the services that you're requesting funding for, respite, discretionary funds, all of that can be found here. And we have the guidelines. So if you can't quite remember what the rules are for that program or what the limits are, you can certainly look in those documents. You will notice that most of the documents have um, the document here and then one underneath it listed as Spanish. So we have both English and Spanish versions here on the portal. And also the entire portal can be translated to a number of languages. So if you need that support, let us know and we can show you how to translate the portal. This section is on benefits, so guardianship, Social Security, Medicaid. And then this is a list of resources. So sometimes when people are applying for discretionary funds, they're thinking, what kind of horseback riding agencies are there that specialize in working with people with different types of disabilities? So what we've done is over the years, families have told us, oh, I've really loved this vendor and we'll put them on the list. So we don't support any one vendor and these names just came from different families who have used them and enjoy using them. So we thought we'd put them on a list so that way we can share them amongst families. The same with our camps list. As some of you might remember, we offer a campership program. And so when people use a camp and they give us the positive feedback that they enjoyed it, we add it here to our list. We also have a list of college and vocational programs that specialize in supporting students with disabilities. So just different types of lists that might be of help to you at any time. For those of you who uh, have students in high school transition, so 14 and older, we've been doing a lot of work together and we have a series called Teens Transitioning Together with different fact sheets and checklists that explain what you should be doing at certain years so that way you can stay on track for transitioning out of high school. And these are all the sheets here. So again, some of you might never use anything on this left side and some of you might find it really helpful. So we try to keep adding things to the portal that might be of assistance to people. Then we go over here on the right side. And as you can see, Mike's here with us today. So this will actually be customized to your team. So your service coordinator will be here. So sadly, none of you will have Mike Hurley's roguish photo here in uh, your portal, um, but you will see your service coordinator with their name and then their email that you can click and go right to. You can still email them directly through your email. If you click on this, it's going to pop up your email on whatever program that you're on and it's gonna send them an email from your email. It also has their phone number here. 
This is Rachel Neff, and some of you might not know, but she is the glue that holds family support together. She is our operations assistant, and she is the one that has been processing all your claims all along, and she'll continue to do so. So we have her picture here, her name, and again, her email can be clicked here to shoot her a quick email if you have a question for her. So that's kind of your team, and we want to make sure that families always know who they're working with and how to get a hold of them quickly. Then we'll go up here into our middle section. So this is really where we communicate to you as families. Right now, most of you receive a family support blast. We send out emails when we have announcements, if there's gonna be an event, a Chunky's night or a paint night, or if there's, you know, campership is opening up, we send those blasts to your email and we're gonna to continue to do so. The only difference is they're going to come from the portal. So when you get those announcements, there will be a link right in your email to bring you back to the portal should you want to see the announcement there. You don't have to because the announcement will be in its entirety in your email, but you'll also be able to link back to the portal. So nothing will change. You'll still get emails the same way you do. There will just be a link in it. So if you read it and said, oh, I better go put that in the portal, you can click right in your email and get here quickly. Any of those announcements will also show up here. Our previous portal, they let us know that they didn't want to have to keep going in the portal every day just to see if anything got new got announced. So that's why we have it attached to the email just like we have been so you can stay informed. The next section is our dashboard and this is something that's really exciting for us. This is a draft version of our dashboard. And so in the past when you've submitted respite or discretionary funds, you kind of as families have had to keep track in your head or connect with your service coordinator or Rachel to see how much is left. What we want to be able to do is give you that information right up front. So when you log into your portal, yours will be adapted to your specific case, your child, and you will see there's respite. The orange shows you how much is remaining and then the blue is how much is used. And when we update this portal, it will actually have the amounts next to them. That way, if you're thinking, oh, I want to submit some respite, but I'm not sure how much I have left, you'll be able to see it up here, the general, how much you have left. The same with discretionary funds and COVID funds in campership. The next box is called needing attention. When we built our other portal, our family said, we just want to know if you need us to do something. We don't want all kinds of information. So we said, okay, we added this box and it has worked really well in our other portal. So when you log in, you'll see this box. If there is nothing in it, that means you're all set. We're not pending anything from you. But if you see something in it, that means we need you to do something. So for example, this one is a respite request. I can see that because it says respite right here and it says it's declined. If I click on it, it will actually tell me why it is declined. And I'll go over those statuses. Um, a, de a, de a decline could be because you submitted respite and you already submitted respite for that day, or maybe you submitted a discretionary fund request that was, um, we have another question for, or council reviewed it and they had a question. When we send you, when we decline something that's submitted to the portal, it's going to send you an email right to your email account with the information and again another link to your portal to send you back to the portal should you want to return to the portal to see that information. So that's what this box is and there will be items in there only if we need you to do something. If there's nothing in it then you're great. We're not pending anything from you. I'm going to scroll down and show you our process grid. This is the grid where you're going to be able to see after you submit something that it's in progress or it has been um, it's been processed or moved on. And we have this grid here to help you explain to you where it is. So if you look at the state here, a new request is the start of something new. If it's submitted, that means you just submitted it and no one at Gateways has reviewed it just yet. Pending means that it's being reviewed by our Family Support Advisory Council. So for example, the discretionary fund requests, those go to our council, a subgroup of the council. We do not share any of the client specific information, just the narrative, and they vote on whether they approve it or not. And then that goes back um, to us and then we will process it. So if it says pending, it might be with the Family Support. If it's been approved, that means it's been sent to accounting. So accounting is gonna process it and get that check cut for you. And that's what process means down here. Your request has been accepted by accounting and it's in the queue. So no further action is needed. That means the check is on the way to you. Um, and we just went over declined. We also have a section called bright ideas. And once we handle your bright idea, then it will be closed. And I'll go over that 
in a minute. So there's this little cheat grid of where it's at, but it's helpful for you to know, has anyone looked at it? Is it with the business office? When am I getting my check? So it's really helpful to know what these statuses are so you know where your process, your payment is being processed. All right, so now the good stuff. Right here in the middle is really where you make all of your submissions. It also has an archive. Everything that is submitted to the portal is kept here forever. So we wanna be very transparent with families. Anything that you submit, you'll be able to see. This can be really, really helpful. For example, if you can't quite remember when the last day was you submitted respite, you can go right into the archive and it will show you. And I'll go through that after I show you how to make new requests. So this column here on the left says submit requests. These are the pictures and the um, boxes you're gonna to check to in order to submit something. So what I'll do next is go through each service and go through it step by step. You will see that it's very repetitive. We have also based all of these forms on the paper forms that you all have been using for a number of years. You all are used to those forms, you know how to use them. And so when we created the portal, we made sure that it looked almost exactly like those forms whenever possible. So feedback so far has been like, wow, it's just like the forms. Um, so we hope you'll find that same experience. So let's get started. This first one here is respite reimbursement. So just a reminder, respite reimbursement is when you have paid somebody to care for your loved one or yourself and you're getting reimbursed for that. And so nothing has changed. Everything that's in the form, the same processes are in place. When you log into a request that you're submitting, it will have your applicant and the email. The applicant is the primary contact that we have at Gateways. It's the person that your service coordinator usually calls first and the email attached to it. So anytime the portal is sending you a message, it's going to go to this email. So it's always good to see this here. It's gonna autofill. If you want that change to someone else, you can work with your service coordinator and we can change it um, in our system and then it will show up here to that system. So whenever you're making a request, you have to choose the participant. So when I press this arrow, it drops down and it shows me my child, Patty Practice. So I'm gonna click Patty Practice as my child. The reason we have a drop down is that some of the families we work with have two or three or four or even five or six children that we all support. And so we want you to be able to choose whatever child that you're sub submitting for. We, in our other portal, we used to have different logins for each child, but a lot of our families gave us feedback and said, that's way too much. Can I just have one login? So that's why we've added this feature here. So you can, it'll be programmed just to your children and you can choose which child you're submitting to. So you're always gonna pick the individual. And then the first time you enter into the portal, it's you're going to need to type in the information. But after that, it'll drop down as a previously stored name or address and it will make it easier for you to go through the portal. So this is respite reimbursement. So again, I'm paying myself back typically. And so pay to, I'm going to put myself in here. So we're going to pay it to me, Mindy Huckins, and then my mailing address. Where do I want the check to go? So this is the same as the form. It's really important that you check this over and make sure that it's accurate because this is who the check's gonna be made out to and this is the address. And it's never good if we send the check to the wrong place or the wrong person. So make sure whatever you type in here is typed correctly. We do have spell check inside of the portal. So then the next section is respite received. So this is the month that we're choosing. So if you remember on the form, you always had to write in what month you were on. So I'm gonna put one in for May and the year is 2021. As a reminder with respite, you respite reimbursement means you've already paid them. So it should not be a date that is in the future. It'll be a date in the past or a month in the past or, or what have you. If you see here, there's a red asterisk. The red asterisk means that you have to fill in those data points or will not allow you to submit it. So we've done that to help prevent errors so we don't have a lot of declines for requests. So those are good reminders for you. Then the next is the rate of pay per hour. So if you remember on the form, you wrote the month, you wrote how many hours and at what rate did you pay those people? So I'm gonna just make this up and put $10 an hour. So all of my rates are at $10 an hour. And then down here is the section of our form you'll remember goes across the top. These are just the days of the month. We've also put this reminder here because we are working in decimals. So if you, someone worked with your child for one hour and 15 minutes, you would want to put 1.25 hours. And if it was an hour and a half, 1.5 hours. 
hour and 45 minutes, 1.75. So we roll by the 15 minutes, and that's just a reminder for you here. So these are the days of the week. So I'm going to say, okay, I'm in the month of May, and I paid someone for a respite for three hours on the 5th, and then maybe for six hours on the 13th. You can also hit tab to go up and down, or you can just click with your mouse, whatever is easiest for you. In our portal, you scroll back up to the top and save is the same as submitted. So I'm going to go ahead and hit save. And you know it's submitted because it brings me back to the home page. But if you're anything like me, I like to be really, really sure. So if you go to this, this is refresh, and you'll see it's like an arrow that's in a circle. If I click that, it'll refresh my screen. And when I go down to the processing, which I reviewed with you earlier, I can see my request. So it was June 7th at 6.20 p.m. I submitted respite reimbursement. So I always like to see it here. It tells me I'm a-okay that I submitted it and it went through and it's ready to be processed. So as you can see, it's submitted, which means no one at Gateways has reviewed it because I just submitted it 30 seconds ago. So they might need a little more time than that. Um, so it has the status. So it's always good just to check right here and see that it went through. So that is respite reimbursement. And now I'll show you discretionary funds. So just as a reminder, discretionary funds is a uh, service set up by our council, and it's meant to help support the individuals we serve to be more independent, to access the community, to be safe in their home, or also to provide some training, like perhaps you as a parent want to go to a training on a certain condition, or your child wants to go to a self-advocacy conference, or things like that. This is where families can request um, up to $350 a year towards discretionary funds. This is just like the form, if some of you have experience filling out the form. Again, it auto fills the applicant in the email. This is the primary contact we have at Gateways. We're gonna select the child. So again, I only have Patty practice, so that's who I will select. With discretionary funds, we have three ways we can support a discretionary fund. The first is to reimburse the family. So you've asked for something that you've already paid for and you want us to reimburse you. So that would be the first. The second is you'd like us to pay directly. For example, maybe you signed up for swimming lessons at the YMCA and you want you have an invoice from the YMCA and you want us to pay them directly. That would be pay directly. The third option is that you want us to purchase an item directly. And so that would require you to send us a link of what you want us to purchase. And I'll show you that in a minute. So I'm gonna go ahead and put reimbursement. And again, because this is the first time you're filling in the form, you'll have to type in the information, but it can, auto. It's important to remember that if you pay it directly, payable to is who you want us to pay directly. So if you wanted us to pay the YMCA directly, you would type in pay to YMCA in their address. I'm saying reimburse the family, so I'm just going to put my name in here. And you can see I have a drop down because I've used the portal before, but I will show you. Again, you always want to check and make sure that whatever you put in is accurate because that is who we're going to send the payment to. That's the address we're going to send it to. And how much money am I requesting? So discretionary funds, I can request up to $350. So I'm just going to put $250. Oops, got a little crazy with my zeros there. Okay, $250. And then just like the form, we ask for a narrative and it says, please share how this request specifically addresses a disability related need. So this is the narrative that goes to our council so that they can read it and vote. We do rem remove any names if names were submitted so that council can vote. The reason being is that your council members, we have 22 members and they all live in the communities and many of you know them and they are great leaders. So we don't wanna have anybody's name that way. It's a very fair review of the request for approval. But this is your chance to tell them how it addresses the disability and why you need it. So if I was gonna say uh, swimming lessons, I might say, my child is very attracted to water, so it is important for her to learn to swim. She needs one-to-one -one classes because large groups can overwhelm. So I might write something like that. Whatever you want to go to council for your reason why you're making this request is what you type in here. And then 
And because we serve a thousand families and family support, we always want to make sure that if there's another funder that they've been approached. So it asks you if you've explored other funding options, and if so, listed here. So maybe you asked the school or your insurance or what have you, or you didn't. So I'll just check no here. No other funding was explored. So this last section is really about the payment. So you had three options above. One was reimbursement and one was um, pay directly through an invoice. So in either one of those, in order to make that payment, we need proof that it's been paid. So if it's reimbursement, we need proof that it's been paid. It can be a picture, it can be a PDF, it can be a Word document, it could be any number of files that you wanna upload. And the same with the invoice. If you want us to pay something directly, we need that invoice. If you don't have it on your computer or on your phone, you can easily take a photo of it and upload that as well. So when you are attaching a, your document, it's just the same as if you were attaching it when you were in your email and you're gonna choose your file. It'll bring up to your computer where your files are kept and you can select a document or a picture. You can see that it's attached because it's here. And I can also click on this document and it will come up so I can see it and make sure it's the right document if I want. If you had chosen buy something directly or purchase something directly, this is where you'll paste the link. And as you can see, there's a lot of space. Sometimes a request is for like two sensory items for the same reason. And you can put both of the links here. It's really important you send us a link because we need to make sure we approve the right thing. And also we don't wanna order the wrong thing. So it's really helpful if you give us that link and you can put it right in this box. The last step is just to confirm your payment. So you either attach a document or you put the link. As you can see, it has a red asterisk. So if you don't click here, when you go to submit, it'll tell you there was an error. So I'm gonna put attachment because I had an attachment up here. And then I'm gonna go up and hit save. I know it was submitted because it brings me back to the home page. But again, just to be sure, I can hit the refresh button over here. And if I scroll down, I will now see that a discretionary fund was submitted on the 7th at 626. So I know that it was submitted and that makes me feel confident that it'll be processed soon. The next service is the COVID-19 relief funds. You will see that this looks very similar to discretionary funds because when the council assessed that families might have new needs for COVID uh, based on COVID-19, they developed this service and said, you know what, our families do really well with the discretionary fund form. Let's use the same form to the best of our ability for the same service. So it's very similar to what we processed just now for discretionary funds. And I'll walk you through that. As you can see, it autofills the applicant in the email we're gonna select the eligible participant. So I will select Patty Practice. And I have the same three options as discretionary funds. Either you have already paid for something and you want me to reimburse you, or you want us to pay something directly. For example, a lot of people needed support during COVID-19 to pay electric bills. So maybe you want me to pay a bill directly to Eversource. And so you want to, you're gonna attach a bill or an invoice to them or you have a link to something you want us to purchase. Maybe you need a weighted vest or you needed a desk to set up a play area or a school area for your child during COVID as they were remote learning. And you can put the link in later like we did before. So payable here is either to the family or who you want us to pay directly. So for this one, I'm gonna go ahead and put Eversource. So say we're paying an electric bill, I'm gonna put Eversource and then I need to type their address into here because this is where the check is going. I don't, this is not their actual address. I just made that up, but um, you would put it in, it would be right on the bill. That way we pay it directly. So you always wanna make sure that it's spelled correctly and that it's what you want and the total amount you're requesting. So COVID funds are capped at $200. So I typed it in here. Just like discretionary funds, this is what the council members are reading so that they can approve your request. And so it says, please include detailed information on how the request was directly impacted by COVID-19 and how the request will meet that need. So I might write something it, like due to COVID-19, my hours at work were limited and I need assistance to keep, keep my electric on. And again, you can go over and do spell check. 
So this is the narrative that's going to council for them and they really want to know how does COVID-19 impact this um, because these requests are specifically related to COVID-19 and not necessarily disability specific. It asks you to confirm that you do not know of any other resources that could pay that request. And then just like the last discretionary funds, you have two options here. You can attach a file. So if I was going to pay an Eversource bill, you would want to attach that. And you could do that through a picture or a scan or a document. Or if I'm reimbursing you as the family, you would send a picture of the receipt or a copy of the check or something like that. So again, you choose the file and click on it. I can see it's attached because it's here. And if I was doing a link, I could link, I could copy and paste a link right into here. The last step is to confirm your payment, uh, what you've uploaded. So I have included an attachment, because that's what I said, or a link. And once again, you scroll to the top and hit save. Oh, it looks like I missed something. See how it bounced back and it said payment type in red? So I am going to say pay directly, and now I'll be able to submit. It bound, bring me back to the home page, so I know that it was submitted. But again, I can hit refresh and see it in the process box. So you see my COVID request here on June 7th at 6.30. Campership is um, not open right now, so I'm not going to go through campership because it just closed. And then we also have this new section called Bright Ideas. So this portal started with some staff putting it to bed to develop it. And then for our other portal, we had a family advisory committee who kept giving us ideas. And then we added this bright idea. And every day and every year, people come up with great things. And those go to Mike and those go to Steve and they see if they can make it happen. This portal is designed for you. So it's only as good as you make it. If you see something or dream about something that could make it great, please submit it. We want to hear about it. If there's something you really love about it or something that you wish it did, please go ahead and send us a bright idea. Those go to Steve and Mike, and then they'll bring them to our team and we'll investigate whether we can make that possible or not. And trust me, we've had many, many great bright ideas, and that's what's made the portal so successful over the years. So we really want it to be your portal. So the more feedback you can give us, the better. As I mentioned before, we have the archives. The archives are very, very helpful because they do have your history. So let's go into respite reimbursement. I click onto the archive. All our archive, all our archives open up the same. This is what I kind of consider a summary. So I can see, oh yes, on May, in May I submitted for $90 um, and that's kind of a summary. But if I want more details, I can click over here and it will open up to a PDF of everything that I've submitted. So you can see here, this is who it was paid to. It was for May. It was $10 an hour for nine hours. So it was $90 listed here. And then if I'm trying to remember the last day I submitted, I can simply look down on the days and say, oh, look, the 13th was the last day I submitted. So that's a really helpful tool for um, showing families, you know, going back and looking at your history. You can also see down at this bottom, what day did you create it on? Um, so if it was just last week or the week before and you want to remember how long ago has it been, maybe it's only been a day or two, or maybe it's been five days, so you're not seeing the process change, you can certainly reach out to us. Um, you'll see the change here. And then I want to show you discretionary funds. Discretionary funds and COVID funds look exactly the same. Again, I can click the archive. It gives me a summary. So it says, okay, I requested $250 um, here on June 7th. But if I click into it, I can see the detail. And again, this is who I paid this is the narrative that was submitted to council. No other funding was explored and also the receipt or attachment. So as I mentioned before, maybe you are wondering, you know, it's been a couple months and your friend said, oh my gosh, I really love this way to vest. Where did you get that? And you can't quite remember. You can go back in your portal and pull up that exact request and it will pop right up. You can click the receipt and it will show you um, exactly what you submitted, which is a really nice feature to have. And again, it shows the date that you created it here. And the last would be COVID relief funds, and it looks exactly the same as discretionary funds. So remember, we submitted to Eversource for $200. And if I click it, I can go in and see the narrative. So here's where it went. Here's who I sent it to, how much. Here's the message that I submitted. 
and the attachment if I want to look at it and the, the date that I created it. The last thing we have in the portal that I want to mention is right here, we have a user guide. So if you click into the user guide, it will have a table of contents. And if it's a, like, for example, if it says respite reimbursement, you can click that and it will give you step-by-step -step instructions with pictures. So that's meant to just remind you. We know that this is a lot. We know that it's kind of new and we wanna be here for you. So we have the recorded trainings, we have this user manual, and we also have a PowerPoint that we can share with you as well. And all of the service coordinators have been trained in the portal. So the first few times, if you need their assistance to walk through it, they're happy to help you do that. So that wraps up pretty much all the features of the portal. So I'd just like to open it up to this group to see if anybody has any questions. Mindy, I've got a question. Sure. So I've got stuff from my book from last fall that I didn't know I could probably submit for discretionary funds or COVID. Can I still submit those before the year closes out? Yeah, so discretionary fund and COVID funds are still available and they're open until so the last day you can submit is June 30th. Okay, because I have stuff from the fall that I got for her for online learning and stuff that I didn't know I probably could have submitted back then. Sure, that's fine. You can submit it under COVID. Sure. Yep. Um, okay. so Thank you. You're welcome. I didn't know about those because I don't use I don't use too much other than really for her. So I didn't know about the other two options back then until just now. Well, that's what we're kind of excited so. about is the portal gives you a nice reminder of all the services that are available to you. So that's that's a helpful piece. So I'm glad that made the I don't I actually work for one of your guys' provider companies. So as a DSA, so I forget like my own outside work stuff for my daughter. <laughs> exactly. So, I hope this portal will bring you a reminder of some of these things. And then I see some just, yeah, well, I don't see any other, I see some comments in the chat saying that it's well designed and easy to use. So thank you for that feedback. And does anybody else have any questions that I can answer for you today or Mike can answer for you? It doesn't look like it. So thank you very much. And like we said, your service coordinator will have access to the recording as well as the PowerPoint in our manual if you need any reminders. So thank you so much for taking the time to learn the portal. And we're really excited to see all of our families get to use it. Thanks, everyone.